Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is dispensationalism and everything that goes uh, with it uh, and its relationship and its role in, in, in evangelicalism in general. And I have two guests, uh, Dan Hummel, who is online with us uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, Paul Weaver, who teaches here in in Bible Exposition at Dallas, and we're headed to a conversation about a book entitled The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, which um, um, Paul was kind enough to bring a copy of, so there, there's a, a look at it. And, and Dan, I'll let you tell people what you do, so um, introduce yourself to us. Sure, happy to be with you. Uh, I am here in Madison, Wisconsin. I work at a, a Christian study center called Upper House here that serves the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, I also am starting up a new initiative with the same foundation that funds Upper House called the Lumen Center, which is a, you can think of it as a, a sort of emerging uh, Christian scholarship think tank here in Madison. Um, I've been here in Madison for about uh, uh, now 14 years. Came here for my PhD work in American religious history, and I finished that uh, a few years ago. So, really call Madison home, um, and I we'll, we'll probably get into it. I have a, a deeper history with uh, dispensationalism and the and the evangelical church, but um, maybe that's enough for now. So, um, undergraduate and graduate work. Um, where did you do your PhD? I did it here at, at Madison um, oh, in the history department, and I, I actually uh, my main fields were diplomatic history and intellectual history. And my first my dissertation in my first book was on Christian Zionism, oh. and uh, it, a related but different topic than than dispensationalism. But my interest in dispensations came out of that. Before that, I was in Colorado. I, I went to Colorado State University for my undergrad and my master's degree. And part of the reason I was in at Colorado State was because my family moved to Colorado. Um, after being missionaries with Greater Europe Mission, which is headquartered just north of Colorado Springs. Uh, we were in Germany as, when I was a young kid, and then we ended up landing in Colorado Springs. My dad worked at the home office for many years, and I, I ended up spending you know, middle school and high school in Colorado Springs and, um, and then going on to Colorado State. So, uh, this is personal, but uh, where in Germany? We're um, Southwest Germany in the Freiburg area. We actually were in, we're in a different uh, places. We were there from 88 to, to 93. So it was a really active time to be in uh, West Germany and then reunified Germany. Um, and, and the place that we spent the most time was actually on a farm right next to the Black Forest where um, there were a number of, of German seminarians that came through and were being trained by my dad and some other missionaries. So was he at the Black Forest somewhere. Academy? Yes, he was part of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the reason I say I spent four single years in tubing, and one of which was eighty nine ninety, when the year the wall actually came down. So, so we have uh, a shared background uh, in terms of where where we were located when all that was going on. That's that that's its own podcast. That's its own separate yeah. discussion. <laughs> the world's always smaller than you think it is when and, you get into these conversations. Exactly right. So, uh, Paul, tell us a little bit about your background. So. Sure. So, <clears throat> I've been here at Dallas Seminary for just about two and a half years. Um, before that, I was a missionary with Word of Life Bible Institute in the country of Hungary. I've been a professor of Bible and theology for a total of 21 years. Um, in Hungary, I also directed the Bible Institute there. So, um, uh, f my last year there, we had 79 students from 17 different countries. So, Quite a diverse group for a, a small campus, but training nationals to go to Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Germany, uh, Serbia, all that whole region of the world that was communist bloc countries for so long. And my parents were married in Berlin. My hmm. father was uh, stationed there uh, prior to the fall. So we have a common theme here so far. Oh man, Deutschland. <laughs> uh, I won't say Deutschland über alles, but I almost feel that way. Anyway, um, uh, so, and, and your training was here at Dallas? My THM was here. Mm -hmm. and my PhD I did while in uh, the country of Hungary, uh, directing the school there, teaching, but did my PhD work through Baptist Bible Seminary in Clark Summit. Okay, 
good. So that that gets everybody's credentials out. Mine are um, Dallas uh, THM, and I did my PhD at the University of Aberdeen in New Testament, and then I've been in public space most of the last twenty years in terms of splitting. I'm I'm a schizophrenic person. I, I do New Testament, and then I'm in cultural engagement. So, so those are the backgrounds. So let's talk about the book. Um, so obviously, um, as an MK, right? Uh, you, uh, Dan, you had a lot of exposure to evangelicalism, particularly evangelicalism in Europe. Um, so talk about what what led you to do this book. Yeah, and there's, there's a few different reasons, some more personal and some more, you could say, intellectual. But I start the book talking about just remembering the bookshelf growing up, um, where these big imposing names of Ryrie, Walvoord, and Pentecost uh, were sort of on capital letters on the spines of these books. And this was my dad's library, and, and he is, he's a Dallas uh, grad uh, from, I believe, 87, 86 or 87. Um, and uh, and this was the the world I assume most Christians you know believe the things that were in these books and so um, I grew up in a in a dispensationalist household it wasn't something that we talked a lot about in some explicit way it was just the assumed way um, that uh, that we practiced our faith and it wasn't until I went to college at Colorado State that I really got um, a sense of the the diversity and the breadth of of different Christian uh, traditions. So one reason I'm interested in this topic is because I grew up in it. Hmm. Um, there's a more intellectual reason, or a couple more. Uh, one has to do with uh, something sort of just of the field of American religious history, where I noticed that there wasn't a up-to-date survey of dispensationalism that had been written in, in the past few decades, at least. There, have been, uh, there are a lot of very good books on related topics like evangelicalism and fundamentalism, apocalypticism, and some other related terms that you might be able to, you, you of course would talk about dispensationalism in those topics, but it, it wasn't the subject of inquiry. And so um, that was my pitch to Erdman's in part to publish the book was that we needed an up-to-date narrative that took things past the 1960s and 70s, which is when most of the surveys um, finished. So that was, that was one more intellectual reason. One that was a little more personal to me was um, on my dissertation uh, research, I was in Israel, I spent a year there, and part of what I was doing was I was writing on the Christian Zionist movement, and I came to Israel with a lot of, uh, you could say, U.S.-centric assumptions about Christian Zionism that were actually be, uh, born in the historiography, in the scholarship of Christian Zionism. Particularly, I remember thinking, uh, or I remember reading about how most Christian Zionists would look something like Jerry Falwell, would be Southern, would be Baptist, and would be, uh, you could say, have a certain type of um, American way of talking about Israel and U.S. interests in Israel. I went to Israel. I did find a few of those types of people, but what really struck me was how that is not, at least from Israel's perspective, from the vantage point of Israel, most Christian Zionists today are uh, not in the global north, they're in the global south. Most of them come out of Pentecostal traditions. And interestingly to me, dispensationalism was not at the core of their thinking about uh, Christian Zionism. There's a lot of different uh, strands of why uh, Christian Zionists think uh, support Israel um, that have to do with the Bible. Dispensationalism is not the most popular one outside of uh, the U.S. context. And so that put me on a path for my first book where I really tried to actually diminish the role of dispensationalism in telling the story of Christian Zionism. Not entirely. You can't, you can't not talk about dispensationalism, but particularly to get away from some of the stereotypes that uh, scholars had been writing about um, Christian Zionism, primarily that it's all about sort of ushering in the end times, or that it's all about trying to uh, secretly convert the Jews or covertly convert the Jews. Um, I thought the, those had had their play, and I wanted to talk about different things. And that set me on a trajectory that after I finished that book, I was still curious about why was I not seeing nearly as much dispensationalism in the broader Christian Zionist world than I had expected. And that took me on a path that um, sort of opened up a different way of thinking about the dispensations relationship to evangelicalism that has the shape of this rise and fall narrative that I, I titled the book on. Um, but, but it was really born out of that work and realizing that there was something more to the story as I was studying Christian Zionism about dispensationalism than I was getting from the history books that I was reading up to that point. You know, that's fascinating because I think that uh, um, as I think about this and, and also as I think about your book, that um, getting dispensationalism placed within the larger evangelical conversations is actually an important part of this. And also, 
um, thinking through kind of the legacy of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, which generate generated kind of where we are in evangelicalism today. It's still it, that hasn't gone away in many ways. So um, uh, that bigger frame. I think it's interesting that you mentioned it popped up in your study of Christian Zionism because I actually think that's actually part of the frame for thinking about the, your book as well, this book in particular. So let's talk about that. Let's transition to if you were to summarize in a – people talk about their elevator pitch, but if you were to talk about we're going to go from the first floor to the 30th, okay? Um, if you were to summarize kind of what your thesis is and what you were doing in the book, how would you describe it to us? Yeah, well, I, I start uh, in the middle. I, I start actually with the story of the coining of the term dispensationalism in the 1920s, and I think that gets at the heart of what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to historicize dispensationalism and trying to, to track its origins, uh, at least as a modern theological tradition, in the Plymouth Brethren movement of the 19th century, and really ask questions about how did that context, which is very different from any American context, how did that context actually bridge with American evangelicalism in the 19th century, and why did these particular ideas around a, a certain way to read the Bible, certain distinctions to make um, when reading the Bible, and then a certain type of eschatology to go along with it, how did those uh, concepts become popular enough that they actually became the backbone of evangelicalism in the United States by the turn of the, the 20th century? So I, I'm doing a narrative there. I'm making arguments along the way about why that happened and who the important figures are. And then I see the 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 peak of influence for dispensationalism, uh, particularly in a scholarly mode. I, I draw a distinction about halfway through the book between popular and scholarly or scholastic dispensationalism to try to identify that there are certain institutions like seminaries and certain churches where dispensationalism takes on a very academic tone. And this is, uh, this is an attempt to try to systematize the things that the Brethren gave to, uh, to American evangelicalism. Uh, and, and there's a conversation there that's happening in Dallas Seminary is a very important part of that conversation. There's also a, a dual track or a related track that's much more popular and much more about reaching a broad audience. So I see those things as peaking, or I see the, the scholarly uh, movement as peaking in influence across evangelicalism in the 1960s, uh, 1950s and 60s. And at the same time, I see a, a decline after that in the scholarly influence of dispensationalism. Well, at the same time, there's this almost totally unexpected, you might say, from the outside, career for popular dispensationalism that really takes off in the 70s and, and becomes uh, a, a sort of default popular theology for much of the American evangelical landscape up to today. So I, tra I track those two uh, different trajectories through the rest of the book um, and, and as close as I can when, when this book finished around 2020 uh, to try to give a snapshot of where I think dispensationalism is in both the scholarly and the academic, the scholarly and the popular spheres uh, today. Okay, that's helpful overview. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. I'd love to, if you don't mind explaining to the audience what a uh, historian of intellectual, intellectual historian would be com compared to like a church, someone that might be a traditional, pure church historian. Yes, um, yes, certainly the way I approach the topics here and everything else I write comes out of my training as an intellectual historian. So intellectual historians uh, really care about texts and, and reading texts and, and obviously be, from the term, they care about ideas as well. I think what makes them different than a historian of ideas, and that, that might be a too fine of a distinction for some, but between a historian of ideas and an intellectual historian, is an intellectual historian really cares about the context within which ideas are formed and developed. And, and some intellectual historians, I'd count myself among them, care about the influence of those ideas beyond just the thinkers that thought them. And so there's, you sort of blend into a, a, a type of cultural history as well. So I like to say that, that I often am interested in three things. I'm interested in ideas, institutions, and individuals, and how the three of those intersect uh, together to create, uh, you know, to, to, to create history, uh, you could say. So um, I, I'm not a church historian in, in, a, in a really traditional sense, which is I'm not writing sort of out of a particular denominational setting with a sort of defense of, of that denomination or that tradition, though I, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't count it up. But I'm sure many of my footnotes and many of the things I've read are indebted to some of those traditional church historians who have maybe, maybe they're fronting a little more some type of doctrinal commitment or some type of confessional commitment that's driving the, what they're asking about and the way they're writing about the same type of history. 
So let me go back and pick up a strand that you talked about, which is let's talk about the origins of dispensationalism a little bit. And one of the conversations that happens between dispensationalists and other evangelicals is the debate about the origins of the movement. Uh, And usually what you hear is is dispensationalism is a rather new, innovative theological tradition coming out of the Plymouth Brethren movement, usually dated in uh, in the 1800s. And thereabouts, and then uh, um, and then develop from there, and then what dispensationalists will talk about are the roots of kiliasm and millennialism from the early church that begins to flow into this tradition as well. Uh, Paul, let me ask you this question because you think about this too. Um, uh, connect the early church history to what we're talking about, and then why might someone make a distinction between what's going on there in that early period and the later development of dispensationalism? So I do have a couple of references here with me. Um, Yeah, we would, I think, as a, uh, we want to be biblical and we want to be driven by the text, but we certainly uh, don't think anything's new under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. So... We want to make sure we're going back to the apostolic fathers and, of course, the apostles themselves. So, mm-hmm. I do believe that, the, as you mentioned, the early church were Kiliists, and that that was a predominant view for several hundred years, and, and uh, I think it was influential. I think Augustine was probably the, the, the influential person that led things away. And, and I'm not a church historian, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I teach, I've taught theology overseas, but uh, I'm sure my colleagues here could do a much better job of articulating all the details, but um, I think we all have the the typical um, the um, the possibility or inclination to look at things around us and evaluate the Bible in light of the culture we see around us. And I think Augustine probably had some of that as well as he saw this emperor, right? The, that's now a Christian and. Uh, and also the head of the state and said, well, um, Christ hasn't returned. Christ hasn't returned. Maybe we misunderstood. We're trying to d- defend the Christian faith. And now we have this uh, holy um, uh, church led by a leader who's also the a Christian, uh, who's also the emperor of the nation. Um, so maybe we misunderstood. So. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we do want to go back to the original church fathers and understand how they understood and certainly how the biblical text understands the millennium. Dan, how, how do you how take that early period of history, and do you connect it at all to the, to the history that we're talking about? Yeah, I, I don't. One, I, I'm not. Um, I'm very limited in my expertise areas. They're basically the 19th and 20th century. or I, Yeah, 19th and 20th century. Maybe I'll claim the aughts. Maybe I'm an expert on the aughts. I don't think I am yet, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, I do take it that, um, you know, there was a book that just came out right around the same time mine did called Discovering Dispensationalism. Mm-hmm. That, that is, is a collected volume, and um, Daryl, you're in that uh, yeah. book, so, um, which makes the case that, <laughs> oh, there you go. There's a copy right there, uh, which makes the case that there is this um, longer tradition of uh, at least dispensational ideas that go back all the way to the early period. I don't have much uh, to say about that in the sense that I, I, I take, I trust the scholars in that volume um, that, that what they're finding is true. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm most interested in is the certain constellation of ideas, the interlocking set of theological commitments that do seem to emerge in the 19th century and, and uh, around Darby. Maybe there's someone that Darby, you know, took it from. That, that wouldn't matter much to me in the way I tell my story because I think from Darby and the – and I'm, I actually try to diminish Darby a little in my book. It's more about the Brethren movement, hmm. and there's actually people around Darby that are a little more important. Darby was sort of hard to read and um, not, the most, uh, not the most entertaining – uh, speaker as well. He had people around him who were much better at this. But you do see pretty clear, and this is where maybe where my intellectual history comes in, you see pretty clear genealogies of thought and training that flow from the Brethren to um, James Brooks, who taught Cyrus uh, Schofield, who you know was connected to others. Um, and that, to me, is the important genealogy there. So I know that this debate about um, about the provenance of either dispensational theology or covenant theology, which, by the way, isn't that much uh, older than dispensational theology in the way we're talking. 
Um, that is a debate that, from my vantage point, is is a um, an intra an intra theological debate. That it, there's a lot of significance put on sort of which one's older or which one has claims. That is less interesting to me as a as an intellectual historian than it would be for a theologian or even a church historian who there's there's a sort of a lot writing within the community on whether how you answer uh, those questions. So I find it all very interesting, and I'm all always willing to learn and and you know discover that. Uh, you know, seventh, uh, 16th century monk who, uh, you know, had uh, a, dis- a church Israel distinction and a literal hermeneutic and a rapture. I don't know. Uh, maybe there's someone like that. I'm not sure. But um, I'm always open to that. But I'm more interested in looking at this this movement that a lot of historians have agreed really starts with the brethren, which is still a remarkable story because the brethren are not, you know, a, a main uh, uh, vein of Protestantism. They're, they're, they're a sect that is not that large. Um, but nevertheless, that's where most historians trace the modern iterations of these ideas. And I'm, I'm totally fine saying it's the modern dispensationalism if that moves us beyond um, these questions about how old a lot of the particular teachings within dispensationalism are. But would you say, uh, you know, I've had that chance, I was joking, I probably know your voice as good as anyone's, uh, but besides your wife, as far as uh, you know, I've, uh, you've made your circuit in different podcasts, so I've wanted to listen, make sure I understand you correctly, and we appreciate you reaching out to me after my podcast discussing this, and we've been going back and forth a little bit. Um, and uh, so, but on the more uh, covenant theology side of those interviews, definitely people picked up on that new and really wanted to drive that home. Would you agree with that in the interviews you've had? Sure. Yeah. Um, and and it, you know, depending on the interviewer, they might be coming from a covenantal perspective, so that for them is sort of a win on their side if they um, if, can be a little if, older. <laughs> yeah, if, if they're a little older, right? Um, and you know, of course, I I'm a Christian. I'm an evangelical. I have my own you know sort of com- commitments on these things, though I don't. Um, I, I honestly, this is I honestly don't understand always what's riding on this debate. I'm at a church right now that is very committed to a multicultural um, vision for their church, and it's a church. I mean, to be honest, like the theology behind modern multicultural churches is not very old. I mean, we're talking you know, 20, 30 years old, where you have sort of a robust conversation about this stuff. That because Just because it's not hundreds of years old does not really have any bearing to me on, on that I think that this is something rooted in the original text and the vision that God has called the church to be. So, in my own ways that I relate to some of these things, it, the, the, the provenance or the, the oldness of the uh, in some ways, I think I'm a, a Protestant, right? <laughs> like, I'm, there's something about sort of protesting against what, what is uh, been there. Now, of, of, oftentimes that's framed, rightly so, in going to retrieve something that had been lost. Mm-hmm. Um, but but uh, in a lot of these debates, I'm, I'm, and I'm learning more as I do more of this uh, circuit, Paul, <laughs> but, uh, as well, but I'm learning more about how these certain things have very strong significances within different communities, partly build up because of the history, the 20th century history of how covenantal and dispensational theology have really seen each other as the primary rivals within the evangelical world. And so these questions about um, authenticity and closeness to the history of Protestantism and other things take on a lot more value than maybe they would if you're just uh, trying to tell the history um, without those, uh, without those uh, significances attached to it. I'm, I'm really glad you've raised this framing of the conversation that happens between dispensationalism and covenant theology, because I do think that is part of what's going on in the story. And I think that part of, part of the story is what I will call the resurgence of the reform movement within evangelicalism that's taken place probably within the last 30 years or so. Um, and, and so part of the, uh, you know, in your book, it's rise and fall of dispensationalism, but it's against the backdrop of the rising influence of the reform tradition, even a return in some ways to the reform tradition across many evan- strands of evangelicalism. And so you've got this popular Christianity that's out there that is uh, widespread and, and much talked about and much discussed and much reflected on in the public. On, on the kinds of things that popularizing dispensationalism was doing alongside this resurgence that's going on within the Reformed tradition, which has been at least a part of what has happened in, in the scholastic and more intellectual parts of evangelicalism. And, and so that contrast is actually uh, a vivid one um, and is part of this conversation. I'd, I'd love to hear your comment on that. 
Yeah, I, I, I largely agree with you. I think that takes us back to just the origins of the term dispensationalism. And this is another thing. When I when I say the origins of the term, that doesn't mean necessarily I mean the origins of dispensationalism, but it's to acknowledge that before around 1927 or 1928, if you were to call someone a dispensationalist, even like a Schofield died, I believe, in 1921, he would have to ask you, what do you mean by that? Because that's not a term that was being used uh, regularly. But the term is coined by a man named Philip Morrow, who is a, a dyed-in-the-wool covenantalist. He actually, re, you know, he, he converted into Christianity in a dispensationalist uh, tradition and then rejected that later on and became one of the arch uh, opponents of dispensationalism. And he coined the term to try to, in his view, identify a heresy he, be he believed was in the fundamentalist movement. And it was a heresy to him on intellectual grounds or sort of substance grounds, but also to him it was... Um, he was trying to identify those fundamentalists who weren't as committed to the civic uh, activism that he was, particularly around anti-evolution and some other uh, social issues. And he called them dispensations because they were otherworldly. They were just waiting for the rapture. All those tropes that seem just so tired today, those come out of the very coining of the term. And so um, I think that the way that covenantalists and dispensationalists um, have uh, sort of contrasted with each other since that time is just it's it's so core to how we need to understand evangelical history at least the the theological side of evangelical history since then as i argue you know institutions are built based around these contrasts that's why you get certain seminaries that you know demand dispensationalist uh, views and certain that demand covenantalist you get mission agencies you get churches and denominations who adopt these different uh, theological systems as a way and this is within you know a fundamentalist evangelical world. And, and that, to me, is a key part of the story of evangelicalism that I thought was missing from a lot of the contemporary uh, historiography of even people who, even uh, Mark Knoll, who wrote my foreword, um, is not someone who tended to, to pick up on these distinctions in the same way. And I think that that's a, if, if that's something I could contribute, was to give a, a stronger theological lens to how we think about evangelicalism and fundamentalism in the 20th century and pull back a little from just using what you might call sociological terms to describe these movements and actually take uh, many of the many of these people on their own terms that they really did care about what dispensationalism versus covenantalism meant much in the same way that in in earlier centuries you know reformers really cared about um, predestination or, and free will and baptism and ter and you know issues today that seem secondary were primary at certain points and for much of the early 20th century uh, this was one of the primary dividing lines of of the evangelical world. So let me. Uh, that, that's a great framing. I'm going to go. I'm going to go before the 1920s, okay? Because I have a take on what I think is going on in evangelicalism at large that also impacts what's happening today, and it goes like this: in the in the middle of the 19th century, uh, before we get to really the rise of the mo fundamentalist modernist uh, movement and controversy, Christianity was seen as holistic. Okay, it was designed to to walk into all spaces of life, and if you want any proof of that, the two key proofs that I like to bring forward are the abolitionist movement, which obviously is a work in public space, thinking about what's going on in public space, and the fact that you had state churches, which had existed for a long time. Okay, so here are, here's a Christianity that's expressing itself through government, governmental structures, and those governmental structures are tightly attached to church structures as well. So we're, we're in a holistic space. The fundamentalist modernist, modernist controversy came along, and what? And I'm gonna, I hate using these labels, but I'm going to have to do it to do this description. Liberals came along and said, "We like the ethics of Christianity, but we're not so sure about the theological story at its base that rotates around Jesus." So they went to public space and worked in public space with a with an element of Judeo-Christian ethic behind it, but they weren't as interested in the soteriological story about how Jesus saves. Conservatives looked at that split, because that's the split of the holistic model, that split and said, ooh, we like that deal, but we're going to reverse it. We're deeply committed to the soteriological story, and we're not so committed to what's happening over here in public space, because that represents in part a rejection of the Bible and the story around Jesus. And it produced a counter-reaction. And so every, everything got split and seen through that double vision, if I can say it that way. And the result was, an, was the impact 
of the fundamentalist modernist controversy with the fundamentalists lining up on one side and the um, uh, liberals lining up on the other. And that continues. That continues till the 1940s when neo what was called the neo-evangelical movement, the evangelical movement emerged as evangelicals tried to distinguish themselves from fundamentalists and saying, no, uh, this is Carl Henry saying, no, the public space does matter. The public space is a part of the Christian, but it had to get over the hurdle now of the divide that had been created in seeing those two spheres uh, previously, of which the reaction that you're talking about in the 1920s, where you have some covenant theologians who still say, because they're fundamentally denominationalists, uh, still say the public space matters, okay, while the dispensationalists are saying, yeah, but you better not forget the story about Jesus. That's kind of important to the Bible, too. And, and that becomes your conversation, and now we see it today with the same kind of divide, at least among some evangelicals that say, no, the business of the church is really about the soteriological story tied to Jesus, and everything else is more marginal and on the edges, and in fact, it may be influenced by influences that we shouldn't be paying so much attention to versus what's really central to the Bible. And it persists, and any effort to bring it back together has that now extant hurdle to get over in order to connect the two pieces. That's the theory. Um, I, I'll throw that out to both of you. Um, uh, what do you think? Because I actually think that's part of the intellectual dynamic, think about being an intellectual historian, <laughs> that's part of the intellectual <clears throat> dynamic and context that's operating here, which means, here's the why well, how it relates to this conversation, that dispensationalism is a part of the larger fundamentalist discussion as opposed to being the driver for the fundamentalist discussion. Oh, I'd love your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I ha I do have a um, a lot of critiques of this book, and you know that, Dan, and uh, some of it has to do with – that's why I asked the question about intellectual history and being an intellectual historian, because I do think it requires a great deal of interpretation and of the facts, and, and I do appreciate uh, Dr. Marsh and Dr. Fazio's treatment as they try to follow this progress of thought, dispensation, discovering dispensationalism following this um, progress of thought. But definitely, I think, uh, and so that's one other critique I would have is that um, uh, sometimes you conflate dispensationalism and fundamentalism, and it, it seems in your writing that it's one hodgepodge of, and uh, seeing the difference between them. I think there's a lot of this that has to do with the uh, cultural fundamentalism and not necessarily, and it'd be good for you to even define our term here, fundamentalism, because I don't know that everybody listening. Well, and let me, let me uh, say it this way. In other words, it's, it's, it's the soteriological dimensions of this conversation that are driving some of the conservatism that you're seeing out of the fundamentalist movement. Uh, as opposed to the eschatology that's driving this conversation. It has spillover effect into eschatology, yeah. but the real concern is at a soteriological level. And so, um, so yeah, so, it, so just react to the way I've, I've tried to frame this. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I totally track what you're saying, and I, I think I largely agree with you. I think a broader thing would be to say that dispensationalism is relevant to the story of evangelicalism for a lot of reasons, eschatology only being one of them, that there's a, that dispensation is much more than eschatology, and so there's a lot more at stake than just your view of the end times. And when you talk about the centrality of soteriology to, you could say, proto-dispensationalism or, or proto-fundamentalism, I think of, I mean, this is a, a core part of the center part of my book, is looking at how uh, what I call new premillennialists, but proto-dispensationalists, we're at the core of, found, of founding Bible institutes, Bible conferences, and mission agencies in the late 19th century. And these were all geared toward a soteriological uh, agenda. These and a defense, a defense of commitments to the Bible in the face of what was happening from modernists, right? That's right, right. And that's a, and a commitment that, um, that the gospel depended on a high view of the Bible, um, and, and, and that, that that was actually, you know, the calling of the church was to, um, uh, was to spread the, the truth of the gospel uh, as expressed through the Bible. So, so that, that's a big part of it is, is the very uh, sort of structures, the institutions that end, end up perpetuating dispensationalism uh, come out of this, this core concern uh, 
of converting people, of bringing people into the church, particularly because time was short, and that, that was what they were uh, convinced of. So on that front, I really see that as the main driving force of, of proto-dispensationalism up to the fundamentalist movement. And I think you're right, too. I mean, Paul, maybe part of the hodgepodge uh, feeling of, of what I'm doing is um, there are numerous factions within the fundamentalist movement that I actually think, and, and I prob- maybe I overdid it, I don't know. I think previous historians have not been uh, nuanced enough about the different types of, dis- uh, of fundamentalists that are gathering together under, as Daryl talked about it, um, this broader sort of, you're, you're being forced into one camp or the other on these core issues of the faith, the fundamentals of the faith. And if you are a conservative or, or a fundamentalist on these things, well, then there's all these other differences you might have with your co-fundamentalists that end up having to be worked out, uh, certainly after the split happens, and you all are just hanging out as fundamentalists at this point, either exiled or have exited your churches. And that's really where you see the institution building starting to happen as well, along these very lines. So you have um, you know, Evangelical Theological College, Dallas Theological Seminary, founded in uh, 1924, uh, and you have Westminster Theological Seminary, founded a few years later, and these become sort of different poles within this uh, entirely fundamentalist debate. So they're not, you know, enlisting University of Chicago Divinity School faculty members on their sides. Those people are so far outside of the community of concern. Um, but but between these two, this is the, the these are there are some key questions about um, about how to read the Bible, about uh, what the gospel is, and other things, even within just the fundamentalist world. I think it's important that when we get to the new evangelicals just a few years later, this becomes one of their uh, hobby horses, for lack of a better term, is getting rid of dispensationalism, at least for many of the leaders, people like Carl Henry and Harold Ockengay, and then George Ladd comes by, it comes just a few years later. They identify dispensationalism as the bad part of fundamentalism. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that's what they're saying. And that becomes this big debate within the evangelical fundamentalist world. And you have Dallas Seminary, you know, professors taking one side, and you have Fuller Seminary professors taking another side. And these become the ways that sort of the social structure of evangelicalism, at least in the scholarly level, um, is developing. And I think it comes down to this, um, this insight you had, Daryl, about the fundamentalist movement and that dispensationalism is not driving it. It's driving parts of it. And dispensationalists are absolutely crucial to the fundamentalist movement. Yeah, it's a response but, to it in some way. Dispensationalism as a, as a was a response to it. To it. Yeah, because yeah. it's trying to defend the credibility of the scripture. That's right. And you and even you, you get this. This is talked about at the time. So Jay Gresham Machen, the you know famous fundamentalist, he talks about premillennialists. He would call them because he grouped all premillennialists together. Um, he talked about how they were problematic on so many things, but they were also so core or so solid on the really th- the things that mattered that he was willing to work with them uh, during the fundamentalist period. But, you know, it's, it's like many stories. Um, when there's a moment of crisis, you work with people because you see eye to eye, and then when the crisis passes, uh, you start uh, moving down into the secondary issues and start dividing over those things. And I think that's one of the things that's ha- that happened in the fundamentalist movement uh, after the 1920s. And then much of the many of the institutions that we have even still today are a result of that story. And then, of course, when evangelicalism came along and tried to re- make some at least some level of reconnection between things that had been separated, that uh, – that produced, uh, I got to say, a series of calibrations that everyone was making about how much do we give attention to that versus this. And that, and that produced the variety of strands that you see out there that we cope with today and that are out there today. And so on some things, you know, when we're thinking about Christianity in the midst of a pluralistic world, there's a sense we're allies. But when we get into, all right, how should we do this and what should we emphasize and what should the testimony of the church look like, there are these little inner, inner family um, conversations, if we elevate them a little higher, a squabble, a little higher, debates, you know, that take place that, that are, that are uh, about ap- applying the relative priorities that we're giving to things as we put the whole package of our faith together. And that's what you're seeing is, is, the, re- is the result of that, although I do think that since, I'm going to say the 1990s, uh, 
uh, and maybe even earlier than that, although there is a question I want to ask Paul about Moody that's coming up, but um, you do see uh, uh, an awareness and an appreciation of the need to be working more closely together because of the bigger concerns that the church faces in in terms of the challenge of the world. And it isn't like public space isn't a part of that conversation, because it is. It's actually where the witness happens, so that's not a minor detail. And, And so I think we see that going on. Let me ask Paul this question because we've we've assumed something that I think at least needs some qualification perhaps, and that is that there wasn't a, a social concern among these early dispensationalists. We might discuss how wide and broad it is. That might be another discussion. But the idea that there wasn't some kind of a social concern and that the only position that dispensationalists had, one of the things that we're reacting to is there are certain there are certain descriptions of dispensationalists coming from those who reject dispensationalism that we don't accept as reflective of actually who we are. And so we're, we're a little, we, that makes us a little nervous and helps me have my hairline and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so, um, and so one of those is the idea of, well, the idea was, you know, you can't rescue people on the sinking Titanic, so the goal is to get as many people in the saving boats that you can get before the Titanic sinks. That kind of thing is a kind of emphasis, which in some expressions, rhetorical expressions of dispensationalism, you would hear in this period. But there are also other things going on that are also happening that show at least some awareness of a need to have a testimony in public space. So that's why I'm going to ask Paul this question. Tell us about uh, about D.L. Moody and how you see him fitting into this kind of a conversation the way that we framed it. Yeah, so your your book's been a good bit of time, on, rightly so, on D.L. Moody and his ability to uh, unify um, different people for mission agencies, starting mission agencies, starting schools, and uh, and in this conversation, it's a little softer presentation than maybe in a covenantal situation where... Uh, uh, where the discussion also in your book is about how there is a big neglect. It was kind of, a, it appeared or sounded like an underhanded comment or underhanded compliment, I should say, that the unifying to go and reach the lost abroad, but failing to do anything from a social, um, political side of things. And so I would like your comment after uh, uh, on that, but I do want to say that. Uh, and then also, I feel like there's some marginalizing, saying it's all white evangelicals, and that comes up multiple times uh, in your chapters. And one of the books I think it's come to your attention more recently is called Black Fundamentalism, right? Where they discuss, you know, written in 2021, where it talks about um, black individuals who were fundamentalist doctrinally, theologically, but also some dispensationalists there that were influenced that direction. And I even think three years after Dallas Seminary started, 1924, three years later, uh, just down the road, um, the Southern Bible Institute was formed, which was uh, previously known as Dallas Colored Bible School. And it was started by uh, graduate students here at Dallas Seminary that went and established this school in the midst of the segregated South to really influence and to help and to train uh, they came, um, these students came asking for training, and um, Edward Ironside, who's, you know, the last name, obviously, yeah. uh, his, his, the son of, uh, of the president or the pastor at Moody Memorial, right? Yeah. Um, he started this school. And so we had professors like Charles Feinberg, uh, John Walver, Dwight Pentecost, Merrill Unger, all who taught there. Uh, during the the history of the school, so I think that then uh, um, so I feel like it puts us in a bad light. Certainly, there is racism in the history of every back then. I, maybe you want to talk about that. Um, there's racism in every brand of Christianity at the time, um, but to uh, kind of to say it's white evangelical repeated multiple times. Yeah, and here, seem here's fair. another here's another factor. Let me uh, uh, when we think about Moody, Moody was doing stuff in the city of Chicago in a variety of ways. Um, that's one example. Another example all is has nothing to do with dispensationalism, but shows the cultural forces, and that's the history of Wheaton College. Uh, 
If you look at Jonathan Blanchard, who was an abolitionist, talked about race and the need to abolish slavery in the lead up to the Civil War. Wheaton College was founded as an abolitionist institution, et cetera. And then once the Civil War happened and the slavery problem was solved, I'll just put it in quotes, okay, he stopped talking about race. And he went on to talk about masons and gambling and prohibition and those kind, the you know the moral character of America, that that kind of thing. And race kind of dropped off the map. And so what we see in in this in this conservative Christianity of the time is um, the engagement with some things, but it's not it's it's not full. Um, I mean, even the example of the Southern Bible College, which was mentioned, gets founded here as the out- offshoot of giving theological ac- uh, education to uh, to blacks here in the Dallas area, still is a segregated educational system. It, it's not. It's it's not you know having a Tony Evans come into the Dallas campus, which you know didn't happen until uh, the late 60, early seventies. Yeah, so um, you know, and I, I could tell you stories about that 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 show this. And so, so when we talk about the cultural context of what's happening here as being influencers, I think we see it in these examples. Yeah. Where people are reaching out in certain directions, even out of a certain certain theological system, but they aren't applied in in with a with a with a fullness, if I can say it that way, that maybe today on looking back we say, well, yeah, that's a step in that direction, but that certainly doesn't deal with everything that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I would agree with that, and and maybe to to frame it in ways that um, interact with what Paul was bringing up about the story I tell. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say I do cover uh, briefly and and too briefly probably um, b- black premillennialism. It's just a couple pages, but but part of my one, one of the questions it wasn't the driving question, but it was a question I had as I started this was why aren't there more black dispensationalists? Why isn't this a major stream in African American Christianity? As you mentioned, there, black Americans and, and evangelicals tend to share a lot of fundamental uh, beliefs about the Bible, about who Jesus is, about all that kind of stuff. So why why didn't that happen? Uh, so that was one of the the animating questions. And and Moody, I'll get to Moody in a minute, but Moody's a big part of that for me. I do want to just say there are other people that are important mentioning that on an individual level, um, either personally or publicly, were uh, you could say ahead of their times or just better on race than others. I think of A. T. Pearson, who is an important uh, turn of the century um, uh, dispensationalist, totally tied into the networks that everyone else we're talking about was into. And, uh, you know, he published um, uh, a number of African-American authors in the late 19th, early 20th, early 20th century, including W.B. Du Bois um, hmm. in his journals. And, and that he didn't have to do that. That was actually something he was, he was convicted based on his passion for missions, that it, it would be almost impossible to convert Africans when they looked at American society and saw rampant segregation. So that, that was a vision out there. However, I think the broader thrust of what happened in the dispensationalist uh, reception uh, coming from the Brethren and then moving into the late 19th century was an appeal to missions, and this was it's very contextual. So it's happening in the Reconstruction era. This is when Moody is very pro- prominent in the, ni- in the 1870s is when he really takes off. And Moody is having to make over and over again an overture to Christians who were either in the North or in the South and who were entirely still divided by the animus around the Civil War. And his appeal was, let's get past that. Let's move into the global missions movement as the way to live out our faith. And and part of that was driven by his dispensationalist convictions about the importance of missions and about the, the spirituality of the church. And in practice, what that meant was, particularly for Southern uh, evangelicals, was we this was the tacit agreement was we will put up with Jim Crow segregation and we will put up with um, the peculiar southern ways of dealing with race if you commit to the global missions movement and you can maybe argue with me that that I didn't show that enough or um, or or there, there's another side to that story but I think it's pretty clear that Moody made that overture over and over again and I don't mean it as a backhand compliment like I think it's a very fraught question. If you are deeply committed to missions, and yet there are these 
local, local national um, barriers to getting people on board to missions, what do you prioritize? Do you, in, a, in an, an alternate reality, does Moody become a social justice warrior on race and basically become an entirely polarizing figure and he can't get nearly as much missions work as he wants done? Or do you do the flip side, which is more of what he did, which is to, um, you know, talk about, uh, and I, I get into this in the book, but, but he framed the Civil War in a way that, as historians we now know, was, was the way that was becoming prominent, which was to remove the issue of slavery around why the war happened, to talk about brotherhood over division, and to point to uh, otherworldly goals like missions work as a way to move past the what, what could have been decades of being mired in this whose fault was the Civil War. So that's the choice I see. And then I see multiple, I see generations after that making a similar choice. It's much easier to make the choice after someone made it for you and you're sort of uh, on that road. But that, that would be the terms I'd want to talk about race. I'm really happy you brought up, uh, Paul, the Dallas Color Bible School. I, I knew nothing about that. So that's something I want to uh, read more about. And that seems to me like, um, like something maybe uh, that, that is worth um, adding into another narrative of this. But I, I still think on the big scope, to get back to what um, was said before, that there, there's, a, there's a lack of fullness here. And even if on an individual level, on a personal level, I, I don't think I ever call anyone a racist or something on an individual level. I didn't detect much of that. I, I, most of these people on, the, on their personal conduct, they were quite um, friendly to everyone they came across. But on a structural level or on a sort of missional level, they made decisions or they prioritized things that I think had a certain trajectory and, and consequences for the later story of dispensationalism. And the point that I'm making through the Blanchard example is to say this wasn't something unique to dispensationalism. This was culturally right. at large across oh, totally conservative theology. Yeah. And, and and so that's and, – and the and the trouble was, I think, what we, we came the trouble is because public space got captured in this – in this division that came from the fundamentalist modernist controversy, it became very difficult to move into that space and have conservatives view it positively. Okay, it was always viewed with the suspicion of that's something liberals do, that's something you do when you're moving away from the Bible, that kind of thing, and that that worked against anyone. You know, that worked against Pearson trying to say there's a different way to do this, and there's a there's a, a more um, unified way, more cohesive way to do this in light of your faith than than what you're seeing here. And I think that's at play. We we're, we're rapidly running. Go ahead. We're rapidly running out of time. There is one more issue I want to be sure and discuss. So we're going to run long. But go ahead. Well, I was just again. I don't think it's inherent in the system of dispensationalism, and I think it is more these issues uh, of culture and problems that were plaguing all denominations. And even in some of the discussions you had with other guys, those that were more informed were a little bit more reserved in their interaction on this, but those that weren't, they loved it. It was sensational and and without where, awareness of their own really bad history. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me cut this two ways, because I think that there's actually two things being said, both of which you, people need to pay attention to. I think what we're saying is, is that there are cultural influences that are overwhelming for all traditions mm -hmm. in Christianity in one way. They are framing the discussions that are taking place, and in some cases even driving them. I think what you're trying to say back, which which I take, is, but certain systems were inclined to take what was coming from the culture and block off certain discussions because of the way they were set up and the way they saw the world that other traditions weren't quite so inclined to. And so that's the element of dispensationalism that you're raising questions about. I, I actually think there's something to think about there that's that's worth raising and discussing and, and thinking about it. And this transitions to where I want to go next, which is the way you handle the most recent period. Okay, and now now you're going to get my reaction, and I and, and this this is this is bad story for everybody. Okay, and it goes like this. You took the, the progressive dispensationalism discussion and almost set it off to the side. Now, and I, you did that for two important reasons. One, it, the progressive dispensationalism hasn't penetrated the cop popular culture in the way that the popular dispensationalism has. Check. Um, you also did it because 
traditional dispensationalists themselves raised questions about who we were as progressive dispensationalists. Check. Okay? But then my next observation is, I don't have the job I have at Dallas Theological Seminary doing the things that I do if much of what you said is true of dispensationalism is true. So that's a non-check. And, and, and so the reason why the inner dispensational dialogue is important is for the same very reason you are saying the, dis, the conversation of dispensationalism with evangelicalism is important. If I can say it that way, yeah. so I'm just gonna I, I'm just gonna throw that out there and see what you think. Uh, that's interesting. Um, you're right. I do. Well, I don't know if I set it aside. I definitely treat progressive dispensationalism as part of the decline of a continuity in dispensationalist scholarly activity. Um, part of that is I probably do, and maybe this is irreconcilable. It's just a reading of the history, or maybe I. I just need to uh, sit at your your feet a little longer and, and learn the the way to talk about this properly. But is that in I your, do is that in your chapter on collapse or aftermath? Which one is that? Uh, collapse would be the one. That, yeah. That's in, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, in collapse is uh, I mean in collapse I'm trying to track a few different ways that the what I see is the pinnacle of scholastic dispensationalism, which is the Walvoord, Ryrie, Pentecost, 60s, 70s. What's happening in the 80s that's really starting to chip away. At their authority. And there's a number of things. Um, uh, there's Reconstructionism that is, you know, picking away. And I see progressive dispensations, at least at the time in the 90s, was seen as, at least by many of the leading lights of dispensationalism, as a significant threat. And they were reading it in this coded way that you would read it if you were within a covenant dispensationalist frame, which is that anything that deviates from the categories that dispensationalists have, have established must be a slide toward liberalism or toward mainstream evangelicalism, and that's the whole point. Or even reform theology. It, can't, it doesn't have to be that bad. It can be, you right. know, it, can, it could just right. be towards reform theology. Go ahead. Right. And so that, that fit in with, um, with this sense that there's a declining scholarly authority uh, writ large. Now, I think you're, I, I'd have to think about it more. Like, like, what would the story look like differently if I just treated progressive dispensationalism as another era? or another iteration, much like I treat the transition from Brethren to American, from American proto-dispensationalism to dispensationalism, and what if progressive dispensationalism was sort of the next day? I, I guess there's too many traditional dispensationalists around for me to see that as a, a narrative that, that wouldn't be really complicated to write um, as well. But I think you're right. I mean, I've been reflecting on this. The, the one critique you could have of my book that I think I would agree with is that I have a a narrow definition of dispensationalism. That's where I was going next, so that's good. That's, Go ahead. That's largely, yeah, calcified in mid-century, 20th century. And I've, I've gotten critiques from others. I don't talk about mid-acts uh, dispensationalism yeah. at all. I, I think there's like one paragraph on it. And that, I've gotten critiques from that side, too, that if you're going to talk about dispensationalism in the title, you better include the sub uh, the sub sub strands as well. Um, that, that's something I can think about. I also, I just, maybe I'm like 50% there, but I'm not 100% there that um, what we see in progressive dispensationalism isn't actually what the traditional dispensationalist said it was, which is an adoption of categories that moved everyone closer to a center that was actually more on covenantalist terms, neo-evangelical terms. Uh, than anything else. Okay, let me tell you why I think that's a poor framing, because I think this is an important conversation. And that and that is that what we did was to say there are things coming in critique of dispensationalism from the reform tradition that need to be taken biblically seriously. Okay? There are also things that dispensationalism has always been arguing for that don't need to be abandoned. And so and in the end when it comes to the um the livelihood of the prophetic word, that God keeps his commitments, that he keeps his commitments to Israel to whom he made them, that Israel has a future in the plan of God, which are all dispensational points in one way or another, uh, that those, those things make what we do very, very dispensational. I need to say one thing about the term progressive because of a context we're in now, and that is the term progressive had nothing to do with politics or the outside world, it had everything to do with how the dispensations progressively reveal the program of God within the Scripture. It's an internal, totally internal term. That's important because some people have misread it. But, right. uh, but the point that I'm making here is it is, it is a mix of, 
But our question is not to say which side we're on, okay? Our question is to ask, what's the best biblical combination of factors when you have certain factors that are emphasizing continuity and other biblical factors that are emphasizing discontinuity? And how do you put those together and make them cohere? That's the question we were pursuing. And so we weren't interested, I'm going to say it this way, we weren't interested in the, in the tribalizing of the conversation. We were interested in trying to get people to reflect biblically on the conversation. Conversation. And one of the things that I think has happened that is kind of odd is that in covenantalism, there became a movement called progressive covenantalism in reaction right. to what we were doing and in response to what we were doing. So we catalyzed the very conversation we were trying to have across evangelicalism because we weren't just speaking to other dispensationalists. We were also speaking to evangelicals at large, particularly in light of some of the things that they said they thought disqualified dispensationalism from being seriously considered. And we were saying, I think you can seriously consider us if you will see that we have done some listening interaction and we're asking for whether or not there's a better there's a better way to think of the world than the two boxes we were currently in at the time. Yeah. Paul, thoughts on that? Well, you want to pit us against each other? <laughs> I'm, I'm genuinely curious. <laughs> no, um, I, I appreciate his point on believing in an ethnic future for Israel mm -hmm. and we're I was just talking about this as well. It's, it's not a Michael Horton recently has mm -hmm. in print and in speaking has talked about a place for Israel. So, um, so that's interesting that yeah. it's not just uh, staying outside of the covenant uh, community, if you will. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely have a different take on uh, whether whether this is the kingdom now. Um, but I certainly appreciate his uh, uh, holding to a future. Uh, ethnic plan for God in Israel uh, with ethnic. But do you think the expression of theology in the public space is important? Sure. Oh yes, yes. And and again, I I consider myself an optimistic dispensationalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and some of the terminology used, like escape hatch theology, that N. T. Wright uses, and that yeah. Dan has used uh, uh, in. in and uh, in your own words, uh, as agents of the church, Christians are called for renewal of things, not to wait for the declining of everything and go to heaven when everything gets bad. I, that's a caricatured view um, <clears throat> of what we believe. And so I think the church should be engaged. Um, and so, so there's definitely a wide variety within dispensationalists as far as those that maybe are less engaged. Um, maybe, you know, I don't want to use terminology and, and put someone in a category, but that's the complexity of this is that uh, I think it's important uh, for the church to be engaged. But, um, uh, and you're doing that, and uh, I think traditional dispensationalists are doing that too. Yeah, I see some. I see some who do that. I do think that there is a question that sits out there that says, why is it that there's been this inclination to emphasize the kinds of things that traditionally dispensationalists have tended to emphasize, and and then and then be less joined? Although I think many of them did connect to some of the evangelical discussions that said we need to do a better job in public space, and uh, um, and, and to see that not in this liberal conservative conversation, which tends to happen culturally, but to see that as actually this is a way of undergirding the witness that we have that says God cares about people and God cares about how we interact with people both inside the faith and outside the faith as a way of drawing people to the fact that Christians are called to love their neighbor and to love uh, their enemies and to uh, and you know, as part of the great commandment, that this this is a natural extension of the mission that we have, as well as being a natural extension of the idea that when you look at the body of Christ itself and what it contains, it contains people from many tribes and many nations, and it actually is the business of God taking people who are estranged from one another. We know that Jews and Gentiles were very estranged from one another in the first century, and saying, "I'm going to make you family," uh, and that that happens through Christ. But to show that there's an inclination to go in that direction, reach out in that direction, 
depends at least to some degree on how we inter- engage in public in our public ministry uh, outside the church as well as inside the church and that that's all valuable and I think those are all very legitimate questions that can be raised about the way all of us do our theology whether we're covenantalists or dispensationalists or or Methodists or you know who knows uh, that's a yeah. mago day that's that's the nature of our nature as being created in the image of God, not dispensationalism or covenant theology. Yeah, I actually think it's an expression of thinking through the cultural mandate and what the gospel does to address the cultural mandate and recover what the cultural mandate was asking for. So I'm agreeing with you, and 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 so, and yet somehow we've managed in the church to truncate those kinds of questions in ways that actually, if you talk to people who are evangelicals in other parts of the world, don't get. They don't get how we divide it up that way. And the reason they don't get why we divide it up that way is because of some of the cultural influences and debates that we've just talked about that have caused us to see it in a certain way and therefore react by default in certain ways. And so for that reason, I would say, you know, this we need to wrap up, but I would say that this is this is the value uh, of a book like yours, in which, you know, obviously we all don't agree down the line on everything that's going on in there, but there are really, I think, important, serious intellectual questions, I say that so that you'll smile, uh, intellectual questions uh, that uh, need to be pursued and reflected on by all believers as a result of some of the some of the history that you that you present and, and discuss. Even though you know we might calibrate it a little differently than you do. So, um, Dan, I'll give you a final word, and then I'll let Paul wrap up, and then we'll be done. Sure, and I really appreciate the conversation. Um, and I, I'm happy if you are more critical than just have minor uh, critiques. I think Paul has more than minor critiques, and that's fine too. I think part of the what, what I enjoy about this process is, of, of writing books and, and talking is that uh, one I get to learn a lot, and I get to understand uh, even even phrases like Paul pulled out. Um, I don't think I meant what you. I, I I don't dispute you read my words, but I didn't mean what how you read it. And that's a fault of mine as an author that I, um, I didn't word it more carefully. Um, and so anyway, I learned a lot from, from those types of conversations. And then, um, uh, these types of conversations, I think get, I hope, um, when we have them get evangelicals really thinking about f- sort of fundamental questions about how they think about the Bible, how they think about theology, how they think about culture. And that to me is the thing that I ended with, you know, N.T. Wright and some other theologians who really put that front and center. And I, there's plenty of people who you can disagree with, um, you know, big parts of, of what they say. But I've appreciated it here, certainly in my context, working in Madison, a pretty, a pretty post-Christian uh, city, um, and, and trying to give students here an imagination for what it means to, to work for Jesus, to work for the gospel, and ultimately to work for the kingdom. Um, those types of things really are powerful here, and that's part of what drew me to this project as well, was trying to understand how this dispensationalism connect with the work I'm doing now. But um, I appreciate the conversation and, and also the multiple perspectives from the dispensationalist side. It's been a real treat. Well, Dan, I just made you a friend on Facebook, so welcome to the welcome to the world welcome to to the world here. In terms of, and I'd love to follow up because I think there are some very meaningful and even mutually shared conversations that we could have with one another. Paul, what do you? Well, I do appreciate uh, you coming here and being willing to uh, dialogue with us because. Uh, I probably would not have done that if I were in the other <laughs> reversal, going um, as, as, as it relates to, obviously, we've got an impartial moderator here, but, uh, um, but um, and yes, you're right, there's a lot of things I would be critical of that we haven't talked about in the p- podcast yet, and um, we've dialogued a little bit on it, um, and including the sensational title, right, Rise and Fall and Collapse and and aftermath and and all of that. So, my greatest concern with the book uh, is the way it's being used on the various uh, podcasts and talking talking heads and such, and uh, including the one one per, you know I don't want to say the most salacious things. You you probably can think of the ones that were said, uh, but it becomes a tool uh, to to caricature uh, dispensationalists. And so I know that. You're telling us that's not your intent, um, and I take you at at that. Um, and that quote wasn't from your book; it was from um, from a conversation in one of the podcasts. And I know we tend to be less maybe 
careful when we're in different settings and different audiences and, and people that might be more appreciative, uh, appreciative of that. But uh, so uh, th- there, obviously there's a lot we agree on in evangelicalism and, and thankful for your work and what you're doing uh, there in Wisconsin. So thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. All right. Well, we thank you all for joining us here on the table. We hope you'll join us again soon. If you are curious about um, other episodes of the table, you can see them at voice.dts.edu. And we hope you'll join us again soon. Uh, This has been The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture and also discuss the relevance of theology to everyday life. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.